NFL, which the United begin, States Football uh, League is March today. Oh, the today. Oh, 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 oh,
Another sign of good health comes from a mile up in the Rockies, where spring is just a bit late in coming this year. But pro football arrives none too soon for the frenzied fans of the USFL's Denver franchise, who've evolved into the league's strongest supporters. The first challenge comes from the Philadelphia Stars, whose offensive line blows open some holes you can drive a snowplow through. Gold coach Red Miller is panning his own defense, and ex-Penn State quarterback Chuck Fusina finds riches at the end of a rollout. Along with Fusina, the Stars feature one of the league's top rookies in running back Kelvin Bryant. But most of their offense this day belongs to David Trout, who kicks two field goals to extend the visitors' lead to 13 to nothing. Head coach Jim Mora now puts his defense to work, but Denver's Harry Sidney has the goal rushing toward a fourth quarter comeback. The Fever's back at Mile High Stadium, and the goal takes time to plot their last minute strategy. Quarterback Ken Johnson is a late game entry, and after scoring Denver's first touchdown, he's now brought him within striking distance of a victory. There's now less than a minute to play. Denver's trailing 13 to seven, and it's third down, goal to go. The Stars are staging a spirited goal line stand, and now it's down to one make it or break it play. It's the simplest yet most dramatic confrontation football has to offer. Fourth down and goal to go with just seconds remaining. The winner of this play takes it all. Johnson's pass is just out of the reach of Larry Canada, and the final score stands at 13 to 7. Philadelphia the winner in the USFL's version of a TKO. No, folks, we're not in dog country, but in smog country, where today the USFL presents its feature attraction. Herschel goes to Hollywood, starring Herschel Walker and the New Jersey Generals. With special guest star Hugh Campbell and his Los Angeles Express. With the eyes of the world upon him, Herschel takes off on his first pro run and picks up a first down. Head coach Chuck Fairbanks worries about rushing him into this leading role, but after all, this is Herschel's show. Encore, encore, a thing of beauty. But this touchdown romp marks the end of the first act for Herschel, and those LA showgirls spell trouble. Express quarterback Tom Ramsey emerges as the general's enemy number one. Ramsey, who started the day as Mike Gray's understudy, was an All-American at UCLA, so he knows the way to the Coliseum end zone. And halfback Tony Bode sends the message. Herschel who? In the second half, things turn even worse for our hero, as Ramsey finds Mr. Hayes all alone to give L.A. an 11-point jump on the general. Hayes takes time out to express himself, but the scriptwriters aren't quite so pleased. A hasty rewrite is arranged, and a preposterous twist results. L.A. decides to risk its suddenly shrinking lead on fourth down. And when the defense holds, you know who is coming back. That's right, Herschel Walker is back at center stage. But wait, Coach Fairbanks has a surprise of his own. Why he's going to try to win it without Herschel. So on fourth down, Larry Brodsky takes matters into his own hands. Herschel is helpless. An impartial panel meets to decide on the fate of his debut. L.A. comes up a 2015 winner, but you can't blame it on Herschel. After all, he gained 65 yards on 16 carries. And as any star will tell you, you're only as good as your script. The Herschel Walker Show plays next in Philadelphia. But first, a word from Birmingham. With the Stallions playing host, the Michigan Panthers find themselves on the receiving end of some good old Southern hospitality. The name of the 
name of this game is definitely football. As a rookie from Central Michigan named Novo Bajovic gets his kicks with three first half field goals. But wait, the Stallions are rallying around their own million dollar man, quarterback Reggie Collier. Trailing only 9-7, to seven, Birmingham's hopes are looking up till Collier forgets to look out. Former Wisconsin All-American David Greenwood helps convince Collier to stay on the ground, but even there it's not safe. Perhaps Birmingham boss Raleigh Dutch ought to tell Collier about possession being nine-tenths of the law. The Panthers come up with three interceptions to hang on for the 9-7 win. It's a tough way to start a career, but as Michigan head coach Jim Stanley knows, you just got to ride it out. Meanwhile, the USFL ventures across country to Arizona, where a crowd of 45,000 is treated to a Beach Boy serenade and a Beach Girls parade as part of another opening day extravaganza. With folks still wondering if this league is going to fly, Oakland Invader head coach John Ralston and the Arizona Wranglers Doug Shively keep their eyes to the ground. Both teams' attacks are being grounded by a couple of stingy defenses. And like in that other spring sport, it seems the pitchers are ahead of the hitters in the early going. Even ex-Super Bowler Arthur Whittington seems to be just running for cover. But the Invaders' halfback is one of three ex-Raiders still proud to be playing football in Oakland. Along with Ray Chester and Cedric Hardman, Whittington intends to bring another winner to his off-malign town. Leading this blue-collar brigade is quarterback Fred Bassana, a former minor league football player who's made it to the big leagues in a big way. Bassana leads the league in passing efficiency and has the Invaders off to a most impressive start. But in the USFL's inaugural weekend, few offensive performers were heard above the defense. The 12 USFL teams averaged only 14 points each in their debuts as defenders like Michigan's Ray Bentley schooled opposing quarterbacks in the art of denial. Bentley stops two Birmingham drives with crucial interceptions, and his Rolls-Royce performance includes enough collisions to cripple the Stallion offense. Bentley covers the Birmingham carpet like a rug from his inside linebacker post, earning the honor of Defender of the Week. Still a handful of players like Chicago's Tremaine Johnson seem undeterred by the defense's early edge. Scattering about the field from sideline to sideline, the rookie from Grambling swipes 11 passes from the Federal's defense budget and blitzes them with some fancy dance steps. The draft rights to Greg Landry's favorite target cost the blitz three of their own choices, but early returns indicate that, as usual, George Allen made a good deal. Ready, In Tampa, Florida, there's a new craze catching on these days. Go They say bandit ball is all the fun the law allows, so it's no wonder they're turning out in droves. More than 42,000 fans packed Tampa Stadium to help push the league's average attendance over 40,000. Bandit fans are putting their hopes in the hands of an ex-quarterback. But the catch is, he can only watch now, as others do the tossing. For the Bandit's head coach is none other than Steve Spurrier, who somehow looks strange out of that familiar number 11. There could hardly be a Florida football fan from the Gulf to the Atlantic who can't recall the halcyon days of the mid-60s when Spurrier led the University of Florida Gators to national prominence. In 1966, Spurrier passed the Gators to an Orange Bowl triumph over Georgia Tech and was awarded the Heisman Trophy as the best college player in the land. 
A decade and a half later, Spurrier turned up on the sidelines as the offensive coordinator for the Duke Blue Devils and instituted a wide open style of play. In one season, the Devils soared from 127th to fourth in the nation in total offense. And for Steve Spurrier, it was on to the next challenge. It's my great pleasure uh, to introduce our head coach to you, I believe. Uh, the youngest head coach in professional football, Mr. Steve Spurrier. So at the age of 37, Steve Spurrier comes home again. In 1976, he was a starting quarterback when Tampa got its first pro football team. And now, he's the boss of bandit ball as the USFL gets underway by the bay. And now, that historic moment, the first kickoff in USFL history. Well, I guess pigskins get opening day wobbles just like players get the jitters. But in the league's opening contest, Spurrier's Bandits and the Boston Breakers of head coach Dick Corey are hooking up in a stage manager's dream. The Bandits' Ricky Williams proves he knows what to do with a line. And the early reviews are unqualified raves. Quarterback John Reeves, meanwhile, can't wait to spread the word. So he runs the opening act without a huddle. Williams keeps finding the holes, and the ex-Seminole has renewed a love affair with the locals. After Boston breaks on top of the field goal, Reeves sends his secret weapon out of the backfield, and Ricky Williams has the first touchdown in USFL history. But Williams misses a golden opportunity, and with John Walton setting it up, Anthony Steeles gets the honor of performing the league's first spike. Still lots of celebration to go on this one as 32-year-old John Reeves drops back to his glory days at the University of Florida. After six rocky years with two NFL teams, Reeves is proving to be one of the USFL's prime reclamation projects, and his renaissance has the bandit offense spoken. Eric Trevilian latches on to six of Reeves' 29 completions, including a six-yarder in the third period, which puts Tampa Bay back on top. The breakers don't stay down for long, though, and the victory dance turns out to be a touch premature. With the bandits threatening to break it open, the home team falls victim to a stroke of ill fortune and an act of love. Terry Love's got nothing but green in front of him. Bandits' Eric Trevelyan finally brings Love down after a 102-yard return. The lead changes hands for the fifth time on a Tony Davis TD, and the Bandits now find themselves three down with only a quarter to play. Even the most faithful are starting to see red, but the Bandits seem ready to show their true colors. Ricky Williams is grinding out a league leading 97 yards, and all along the feeling persists that Mr. Reeves has another trick up his sleeve. This 33-yard bomb to Willie Gillespie has Bandit fans dizzy with glee and has Tampa Bay back on top. John Walton leads a last gasp drive, but the Boston backbreaker is provided by Ken Taylor. The Bandits are back in the saddle again, and it appears that the two longtime Florida heroes, Spurrier and Reeves, may live happily ever after together in Tampa. The Bandits' win goes down as the first, and a notable league historian has compiled the first list of USFL first. First of all is Ricky Williams, who gets the first down, or the first first down, or something like that. The first points are recorded by Boston's Tim Mazzetti, but what's the point of scoring first if you don't score last? Well, the General's Dave Jacobs misses the point entirely. The Generals are also the first to go for two points and miss them both. The first phone home comes from Keith Moody, and the first 360 by a quarterback is performed by Arizona's Todd Kruger. And now for some of our own history makers. It is with great pride and pleasure that we present the handiwork of our first fired cameraman. It's over there. No, down. Right there. And the first cameraman who wishes he'd been fired before he was hired.
And finally, our first USFL quote of the week. I've read where George Allen is the favorite and Michigan will be last, said the Panthers head coach Jim Stanley. But, Stanley continued, it's not where you start, it's where you finish. It's not where you start, it's where you finish. It's not how you go, it's how you land. A hundred to one shot, you call him a klutz. Can outrun the favorite, all he needs is the guts. Your final return will not diminish. And you can be the cream of the crop. It's not where you start, it's where you finish. And you're gonna finish on top. participants have provided promotional consideration and made a contribution to the United Way.